Hi, and welcome to our show today. We're going to be talking about some very interesting things that you may or may not be aware of, and that's social service and what it can do for you and what resources you might have available to you, whether you're in or out of the hospital. So I have a specialist here that I've known for a long, long time, a dear friend of mine who worked in psychiatry at the hospital with me and is a social worker, but became the head of social service at some very prestigious hospitals. So I want to introduce you to my guest, Tom Tynan. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. So we started out many years ago. You worked in social service in psychiatry and probably other departments that I wasn't aware mm -hmm. of. And then you escalated to be the head of social service at several hospitals. And I think a lot of people don't have any idea what they can or can't get from social service. Okay. So I'd like you to demystify that for us. Okay. Hmm. Well, basically, Karen, um, we call it social work now. We don't mm -hmm. call it social work services. At one point um, in healthcare, most of the people that were social workers were not actually social workers. It's because there was actually you know, a shortage of social workers. The only, uh, when I worked at Christ, the only person that was actually an MSW was the, the manager. I eventually oh. went and got my MSW and I got a master's in counseling psychology too. So, but as far as what social work can do for you, first of all, this is social work month. So it is? social workers out there, happy social work month. Mm. So basically social work, particularly I'm going to talk about health care because that's where my level of, uh, you know, interest and experience is. It, you know, social workers, first of all, are part of the clinical team in a, in a health care setting within a hospital. You've worked with social workers, you worked with me, so you know it's part of the team. What social workers bring to the hospital and bring to health care is their expertise, knowledge in terms of how systems work. One of, that's one of the important elements of being a healthcare social worker. So you, you assist people in connecting with um, services that will assist them once they leave the hospital or even during while they're in the hospital. We can sometimes arrange to have, say a person has a particular diagnosis and they're really concerned about it, we ha I have and we have brought in people who have experienced the same illness, okay, to talk to them, to kind of help them understand what's going on clinically with them, if the mm -hmm. physicians and everybody else has really explained it thoroughly enough. And then um, they get the experiential part of it from, from the person who's actually gone through this. And, the, and there's always then the element of hope. Look, I've gone through all of this, and look, here I am. I'm doing well now. And you can do the same thing. So those are the kinds of things that we like to do, is for, focus on the uh, resources in the community. But as a clinical social worker, there's two basic types of social workers. One's called an LSW, which is someone that's basically right out of graduate school, and, you know, the master's in social work. So that person then needs to have two years of actually supervised clinical experience to become what is the next step is an LCSW. And that's what I am. An LCSW is a, a licensed clinical social worker who can uh, set up their own clinical practice solo. And they also have much more skills basically because of their experience in terms of helping people who are having trouble coping with their illness or having a mental crisis, you know, as well as a physical one, they may have what we call social issues that are preventing them from participating effectively in their own medical care. Uh, they call them social determinants of care. I'm sure you've heard that. And basically, if they have these barriers to their own participation in their own health care that makes it impo you know, impossible really for them to achieve the goals. So what are some examples of that? Let's say you don't have access to your medications. That's an important piece. Mm -hmm. So the physician may or may not, you know, in, in doing his or her evaluation, might not really 
take the time to really say, okay, you know, Mr. Jones, I'm going to put you on, you know, Eliquis. Okay, you know, Eliquis is an expensive medication. So how does, and usually the physician won't say, can you, do you, uh, can you, can you afford this, Mr. Jones? They're not going to generally say that. Now, Mr. Jones then may say, to his family, you know, what am I going to do? I can't afford this medication. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Jones goes home, can't get his medication, now is unable to, you know, do what the doctor told him to do is, you know, to help. Let's, you know, maybe he has AFib or whatever, and he, you know, and Eliquis obviously is helping to prevent a stroke. It's mm -hmm. a blood thinner, as you know. So if, if he does not get that medication, he's going to wind up back in the hospital, in the emergency room. I just had someone tell me that today at my accountant's office that she went to get a medication and pick it up because she got out of the hospital from pneumonia and that, and she went to get some kind of an air breather or whatever. It was $500. She said, I didn't get it. That's right. The end of it. Yeah. 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 Basically, if people can't afford the medicine, they're not going to take it. They have to make a decision. Do I buy food? Do I buy medication? Do I pay my rent? No. That's kind of a simple explanation. But also, there's all kinds of barriers. I can't get there to the hospital. I can't follow up with the physician. Uh, I can't have a visiting nurse come to my house. I, I don't feel comfortable with that. And so there's a lot of emotional, social issues that tend to be barriers in the participation in your own care. So, uh, which is really, as a social worker, as a nurse, you know, that's really critical in terms of making sure that the patient gets the best outcome mm -hmm. from the health care that they receive. So that's, that's the primary role of a social worker. Now I'm obviously giving you a short version of what <laughs> I uh, want to say about it because once you're a social worker in a hospital, you're going to specialize generally. You're going to be an oncology social worker, you're going to be you know, a social worker working with uh, children, you're, you know, you're going to be a NICU, you know. A rehab. A yeah. rehab, so, you know, so you're going to be doing a lot of different things. So what you're doing then is, as a patient, what you're concerned about is this person know the kinds of things that need to be known in order to give me the best possible outcome. So the social workers, as a director, so I was a director, as you mentioned, mm. in a number of different hospitals, I had to rely on the social workers who, you know, if I was the oncology social worker, I would, I, you know, I would be expected to know how to communicate with physicians and patients about the, you know, cancer. But on the other hand, I'm not supposed to be the expert about the medical side. So, you know, even if I begin to understand more and more about what the medical, you know, requirements are mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with the cancer, I. I'm not the one, that, I'm not the expert. What I'm supposed to be the expert on is assisting you as a patient in, as I said, getting the most out of your care, out of your oncology care. And if you're having a tough time, you know, dealing with the cancer, you, re you need somebody to talk to while you're in the hospital, you've got a mental health professional, a social worker to assist you with that. And, you know, you talk to your doctor, he could order that, or you can request that on your own. You don't have to wait for a doctor to well, order Well, that's another your thing. I mean, see, come and see you. does the doctor have to order it? No. I mean, you could just call social service yourself and ask them. It used thing. to be more that the yeah. doctor had, would, would not feel very happy that you came and saw this patient. Oh, really? You think they'd be glad? And... Because without his or her order. But no, that does, that's not required at all. And it might be of interest to you too, this is a service that's provided by the hospital. So you're not going to get individual charges for seeing a social worker. In case you were concerned about that as a patient, you're not going to you know, get a separate bill for seeing you know, a social well, worker. Well, I know where it's helpful, especially, you know, in my own situation even, you know, when someone's going home that's very ill from the hospital and you're trying to figure out, put them in a nursing home, put them in assisted living, put them in at home, what services can they get at home versus what can they get in a nice place? And, you know, I went to seven or eight 
off of a list, nursing homes, mm -hmm. to see what they were like. And, you know, they were off of a list. And who, who do you talk about, you know, what's going to be done there, or what the environment's going to be like? Because, I mean, I went to, I think it was the seventh or eighth one I went to one Friday night that was on the list that I got. And it was a beautiful one. I thought, oh, thank God, because everything else I had been in was awful, <laughs> you know. I think that's the only job I ever quit in my life was as a nurse's aide, as a teenager. I did a lot of candy stripe work, but when I went to work in a nursing home, it was awful. And so, like I said, I went through seven of them one night, and then I found this wonderful one. So, you know, getting the social workers' opinion, because I, I know they go to see some of them. I know that people like myself that owned agencies and home care came and gave talks to social workers about what we did or didn't do. Mm -hmm. Some of us were experts in getting funding through the insurance companies. Others may not be. You may go to a, an agency that's Medicare. You may go to an agency that was private at pay or something like that. So all of that enters into it, how much money the person has, whether they qualify. Because a lot of people don't qualify for things. They either that's have too true. little or too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they fall in between the you know, what's, what's the requirements of getting the assistance they might need. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, a, that's an important piece. Now, when I'm talking about inpatient social work mm -hmm. services that are being provided, there's no charge. But if you're seeing a social worker in an outpatient setting, there may be a fee for seeing a social worker. That really depends on the outpatient facility whether it's you as a private practitioner as a social worker or whether you're working with a, a practice, like a, a medical practice, a group of oncologists, whatever, they may or may not charge for your you know, participation in their, their recovery. Okay. So, or you might work with a psychiatrist. You might work with a psychiatrist. And, and then how does that work? I mean... Well, basically, I have worked with a psychiatrist. Mm. You probably know that. I did outpatient uh, psychotherapy with a psychiatrist. Um, it works well because if, uh, you're, if I'm counseling a patient, doing psychotherapy with the patient, or client as we might call them, I would, uh, if it appeared to me that the, uh, the patient client may need uh, assistance with medication, Let's say they're suffering from, you know, a major depression, mm -hmm. and the counseling in and of itself isn't the answer, and they need something stronger in terms of medication to uh, help them, you know, deal with the uh, depression that they're experiencing. So we work together, we would work together, so, and I would consult with the psychiatrist in terms of, you know, I got a patient that I'm really concerned about. He's, he's expressing, you know, suicidal ideation. He may, he may need, you know, more than outpatient psychotherapy. All right, so now, mm -hmm. how does this work? Like, did somebody refer somebody to you first and then see the psychiatrist? Or did the psychiatrist say, okay, because I had a psychiatrist tell me in recent years that they don't do anything except order the medicine now that they let the psychologists and social workers deal with the therapy. So who starts the ball rolling here? It works both ways. Okay. But in my particular case, it was a psychiatrist would refer mm -hmm. uh, patients to me, okay, who, who they, he or she felt, because there were two psychiatrists mm -hmm. that I worked with, felt would benefit from, you know, more outpatient counseling rather than medication management. Mm -hmm. So, if I come to you as a social worker mm -hmm. so, or licensed therapist, what can I expect you to do? Are you going to talk to me and tell me what to do? Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, I might be tempted to tell you what to do. Right. Karen, but no. It's, uh... <laughs> You've been trying for years. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, basically, um, if you come to me <clears throat> as, you know, someone who's having a problems with anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. whatever the reason, you come to me and sit down and talk to me. I would spend a, quite a bit of time talking to you just like we're talking now, trying to understand what's going on, asking you a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And after we've done what, what I would call an assessment 
uh, which may take more than one visit, actually, depending on the kind of uh, uh, you know, difficulty the, the patient or client is having. We would then talk about, you know, what are the goals? What is it you would like to see happen for coming to see me and working with me? What are your expectations? And then we, because the, the patient's in control, the client's in control. I'm not in control. I can't, you know, I can't make you do anything, okay? It's really up to you to decide what you want and what direction you want to move on. I would help clar try to cl help clarify what's going on in terms of giving feedback, giving empathy, so the person feels understood and cared for, you know, and, and begins to open up more so and more. So you're leading me into figuring out myself what I want. In a way, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And then supporting you in terms of uh, any actions that you wanted to take to, to get to the point where you wanted to be. So that's what Because people have really a fear about. often of seeing a therapist yeah. because they think it's embarrassing. And even when I worked in psychiatry and people were being discharged, they were very upset saying, you know, what am I going to tell my neighbors? I was in a psych unit. I said, tell them you've been checked out and you got released, have they? <laughs> but but mm -hmm. seriously, I mean, people think that there's a stigma to it and people may not mm -hmm. want to tell you that they're suicidal or they're going to commit a homicide or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's clear that up about your being non-judgmental and trying to help them and not just tell them what to do, you know, what they can expect when they see you. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're talking about the stigma of seeing mm -hmm. a, a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist. I think that's much less the case than it was like 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's if you're looking, if you're talking about what's going on now in our society, in terms of the kinds of things that are happening to people, you know, let's just talk about, you know, mass shootings, things like that. Right. We're talking all the time now about getting assistance to those that have, have survived those experiences, so the mental health aspect of that, the, the crisis that they just experienced, the trauma they just experienced. So going to um, a counselor, mm -hmm. you know, psychotherapist, is not frowned upon as much as it once was. Don't you agree with that? Karen? I do agree with that, yeah. So, and I, people are much more accepting of going for that kind of help than they were 20, even, well, 20, probably at least 30, 40 years ago. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, it was almost taboo to, to talk about it mm -hmm. in a family situation for people. They didn't want anybody to know they saw a psychiatrist, which w prevented them frequently from doing what they needed mm -hmm. to do to get better. And I think about these traumas because, you know, I experienced seeing an accident at a parade. I've talked about this before. Someone was coming over to talk to us and got hit by a car by a guy who was on drugs, revved up the car, ran her over, drug her down an icy road. She mm -hmm. lived through it. I turned green, I think. And my husband even said to me, what happened? What did you see? Because I'm used to you even seeing in the emergency room and never turning green. I mean, what happened? But seeing that, knowing that she could have killed me, my nieces and everything else, I, I'm sorry, that he could have killed us, you know, I was having flashbacks for days, mm -hmm. and every time I closed my eyes, I could see this happening again. And I'm thinking, my God, these young kids and everything that are in school shootings and seeing their friends, they know the people. I didn't even know the person. And and I had been through a lot, you know, working in a, mm -hmm. in a terrible neighborhood hospital and everything in the emergency room and all of that, and that didn't do it to me. But that particular situation did. So people do have serious problems after these traumatic incidents. Oh, yes, yes. Sleep disorders may take to, you know, abusing alcohol, um, ongoing depression, pseudo suicidal thoughts of their own at some point in time, losing, you know, a sense of, they have a sense of hopelessness and helplessness after seeing what happened. You know, how safe am I? You know, so in this world, you know, so, yeah. Especially with kids now. So One of the things I used to do, too, was... The first, you know, the the, the first responders mm -hmm. used to. Actually, I went through training to do that. We would assist the first res responders after they've been in a very traumatic 
right. situation, they're affected by it. They're people too. Nurses, doctors, oh, firemen, my husband, policemen. You know my husband and he had to shoot so somebody they, once in the leg to stop him from killing somebody else and he was all upset. And I said, well, you, all you did was graze him in the leg, you know, but he was all upset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, people now I think are much more accepting of mental health and getting help for, you know, when they're in a crisis of some kind, uh, if they're suffering from a depression. Um, I'm not saying that's universal, um, but it's much better than it used to be. And a lot of that depends on their experience with whether it's a social worker or a psychiatrist. If they have an experience where this guy's not helping me, this woman's not helping me, they may not want to seek help in the future. You know, I did that one day in the gym where, where I live, and there was a young man in there that was very disturbed, obviously, and he was talking about some really weird things. And there was a woman in there also, but I said to him, are you seeing a psychiatrist? And he said, yes. I said, please change, because it's not working. I mean, it wasn't a joke that I said it. I was being very serious. She said, how could you say that to him? I said, because I'm serious. He really needs help, and he needs to change, because it's mm -hmm. not helping him. But what would be your specific advice about kids now that we talk about that now? I mean, we didn't grow up in the world that they're growing up in now. So mm -hmm. what can parents do to help be a bit of a therapist or take them to a therapist or whatever to help them feel more comfortable? Or is it not affecting them that much because they're resilient? Well, hopefully, as we know, kids are more resilient mm -hmm. than us adults. But kids are also affected. And kids don't necessarily talk about what's going on. Frequently, they don't. They may then show what's going on through their behavior. So if you start to see behavioral changes in your child. Bad behavior, different no, just, behavior. They're, just. they're behaving differently. You had a straight A student, now doesn't, mm -hmm. go to, doesn't want to go to school anymore, mm -hmm. doesn't do his, his or her homework. Those are some warning signs if they've, if they've gone through some kind of uh, event like you were talking about. So you pick up on that as a parent. The parent has to be open to hearing them. It, it, you know, how you doing, Johnny, or how you doing, Susie, does help in terms of, you know, getting them to open up more and talk about their what had happened to them. One thing that does help, and if you can do it, and it depends on the situation, is to bring people together that have been through the same experience, such as, you know, the family of, uh, of those that did not survive the shooting. Mm -hmm. And to get them all to, you know, different families together to talk about what it is they're going through, how they're feeling, you know, all the anger that they're feeling, all the sense of loss that they're feeling, so that they can understand that this is an experience that is universal. To have some, there's not something wrong with them because they're feeling this way. So it does help to do that kind of thing. But if someone needs more help than that, that they're not, you know, they're depressed, long term, they're thinking suicide, other things like that, then they need, you know, more intensive individual counseling. So social workers in schools and psychologists in schools need to be a little more, um, and not that I'm saying that, mm -hmm. no, but I'm more attuned to what's mm -hmm. going on with the, with, the, with the kids that may have gone through that experience. They may have trouble going back to school that's a frequent thing, you know. Well, yeah, I would imagine. Just going back to school is very, you know, this is, especially if they're going back to the same school. You know, they try to change schools, as you know. Um, no, I remember in nursing school they told us, because like I keep saying, I was in a very, very blighted neighborhood and a very bad neighborhood. We had a lot of serious emergencies in the emergency room and thing. <clears throat> and they told us, you know, it's a good thing you're so young coming to school now because you're not going to think that all of this is going to happen to your family or going to happen to you. You have a way of disassociating from it because you're so young. And they're right, because if I was there now, I'd be scared to death. You know, I was in the middle of riots and everything else. But, you know, the other thing is when we used to have group therapy and psychiatry, I remember like with the alcoholics and stuff, trying to convince them that we went out and had fun and didn't have to get drunk to do it. 
so you know that they could laugh mm -hmm. and you know enjoy themselves without having alcohol as a crutch. In terms of social work itself, let me just get back to that a little, bit, particularly in mm -hmm. healthcare, so I'm a little more clear about that. Is that if, if you're a family member or you're the patient and can speak for yourself, and, and you think you know, I'd, I'd like to. I'm thinking, I'm, it's, I'm really concerned about what's going to happen to me after I leave this hospital. I'm talking on the inpatient side now. And you may talk to the doctor about that. You may talk to the nurse. And one of those two professionals might call social work, you know, come, you know, why don't you speak to um, Mr. Jones? It's always Mr. Jones. <laughs> so if come and speak to him and, and see if you can assist him in any way you ha can. But families can self-initiate the, the referral, and every uh, can hospital, a friend do that? A friend that's a little more, you know, touch and go. Mm -hmm. I would want to understand more about the relationship, but certainly a family member can do that, particularly with a child. Of course, mm -hmm. it requires a family member to do that, parent or to to initiate the referral. It could be, you know, the doctor or the nurse too, but. Um, but that's, you know, so what you would, so if you can in, initiate the referral, you as a patient can, you know, for, and then the, the social workers also have the responsibility to self-identify. So, you know, you have meetings, clinical conferences with the treatment team. They talk about what's going on with the, the patient and, mm -hmm. and with the family if that comes up. So you have a whole group of professionals, nurses, physical therapists, social workers, doctors. Uh, so if it comes up in the conversation that there's something here that, hey, I think I'm going to go drop in and see the Mr. Social. Jones. I think everybody <laughs> so I should see the social worker. I think every patient, mm -hmm. should, they're, they're going to hate me for this, but no, I'm serious because everybody's got some kind of a problem going on. Mm -hmm. it, it might be financial, it might be, uh, you know, hardship, it might be your family relationship, it could be a lot of things. So, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody should take advantage of that service. But I want you to explain again, because we've only got like a minute and a half left, what your credentials are. You know, I, because there's a lot of initials here, and I want them to know exactly what you are. <laughs> well, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, which mm -hmm. means that I've graduated from an accredited school of social work in the master's program. And now uh, I've, after I graduated my master's program, I went into an, you know, basically a clinical setting. And they've already had what we call a placement, you know, but it's an internship during my uh, training. Now I'm going into, you know, providing direct practice, whether it's in a hospital setting, schools. So after two years, then I become a therapist. A, a I have to take an exam to become a licensed clinical social worker. Okay, so you're and a lot of things. <laughs> yes, you're a lot <laughs> of things. Took you a long time, time, but you're a lot of things. <laughs> but, but I know there's a lot of patients that are thankful for that. And we're out of time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to Tom Tynan, who's been the director of many social service programs at many different hospitals. And thank you for joining us. I'm Karen Gibson, registered nurse. Thank you. We'll see you next time.